Hello and welcome to Vera Voices, a podcast series from the Vera Institute of Justice. I'm Jim Parsons, Director of Vera's Substance Use and Mental Health Program, and I'm very pleased to be here today with Ingrid Binswanger, uh, Associate Professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Welcome, Ingrid. So maybe we could start by having you tell us a little bit about the research that you've conducted on the health risks that people um, leaving prison face. Well, we've done a couple different studies. Um, the main study that we've done looking at the death rates after release from prison was done on over 70,000 people being released from Washington State Department of Corrections. And basically, we were able to determine from 1999 to 2009 how many of those people died after they were released from prison and when they died relative to their release from prison. So what do we know about the rates of death after release from prison from your research? Well, the rates of death are very high, especially in the first week after release from prison. And a lot of that early death is related to drug overdose. Um, after that, we see elevated risks that are about three and a half times higher than in the general population um, from a range of conditions, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, homicide and suicide, as well as a number of other infectious diseases and liver problems. So there's a number of causes of death. The risk remains elevated throughout the time after release from prison, but it's especially concentrated early just after release. Mm -hmm. And who is, who is most at risk? Are there particular demographic groups um, or other things that predict um, higher rates of mortality? Well, we're doing more work to learn about that, but some of the things that we found is that obviously people who are older are at somewhat higher risk than people who are younger, and that's normal. Um, you know, we do expect to see increased risks as people age. We also find that women are slightly protected from death relative to men, except for deaths that are related to opiates. And opiates are medications such as oxycodone, which is found in oxycontin, or hydrocodone, which is found in Vicodin or heroin. So we find that women are particularly high risk for deaths that relate to opiate drugs and medications. Are there other um, risk factors, other things? Um, so there's the characteristics of the individual, there's the type of drugs they use. Are there other kind of lifestyle things which predict risk of mortality? Well, some of the things that we've been looking at specifically are around um, criminal justice policies that might affect the risk. So we know that people who've been in prison a longer, there's a very slight decrease in the risk of death. Um, we also know that people who are on community supervision have a slight decrease in the risk of death. But we found, unfortunately, that the risk is also common and somewhat increased if you've been incarcerated for a violation of the terms of your community supervision. So community supervision means things like probation and parole. And what we found that even for those brief incarcerations due to often minor violations, either drug use violations or urine tox screen violations, that people are at significantly higher risk for dying even after those brief incarcerations. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, environmental things, we've done a number of interviews with people recently released from prison to find out what it's like during that post-release experience. And what we learn in those interviews is that people say that they are constantly triggered to use drugs and alcohol. So for example, they may have um, basically witness other people using drugs or be offered drugs often in the neighborhoods that they return to. So it's very hard for people who've been away from that environment and have a history of addiction problems not to relapse. And so that has some implications for where we put social services for this population or how we transition people from prison back home. Mm -hmm. um, can you, so you mentioned a couple of things that can be used to kind of mitigate this risk for people leaving prison. Is there any other things which you think um, could be done to reduce the risk um, of death for people who are leaving, leaving custodial settings? Well, some of the things that we've tried is we did a small pilot study to look at having a patient navigator mm -hmm. who could help people make the appointments that they needed to make in order to get their medications continued. One of the big issues is that people don't have any way to refill their medications after they're released from prison. 
and they also may have lost health care coverage even if they had it before. They may not even have had coverage before they went to prison, but if they did have coverage, say with Medicaid, they may have actually had it discontinued when they're in prison. So this patient navigator worked intensely with people who had some kind of a chronic health condition to help link them back up with services in the community, particularly health care services. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we think might be helpful for this population. Right, great. Um, could you tell me how this compares to the situation in other countries, either in terms of the kind of the, the rates of mortality or some of the kind of policy responses? Well, we know that the rates of mortality in other countries after release from prison are also elevated. So there have been studies from the United Kingdom, there have been studies from Australia that have shown similar elevated risks after release from prison, especially from drug-related causes. There are some things that seem specific to um, other countries that we may not observe here. For example, in Australia, we find that indigenous populations are at particularly high risk. In the United States, we find that whites are actually at higher risk than um, African Americans and Latinos and Asians after release from prison. So um, there are some patterns that are a little bit different, but we do find that in many countries, people face an elevated risk after they come out of prison. Right, yeah, interesting. Um, and are there anything, is there anything that you've seen which is particularly interesting that people are doing in other countries that, that might uh, mitigate this risk? Well, some of the things that we'd like to see happen is more evidence-based uh, addiction care for people who are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, prisoners have very little access to methadone or buprenorphine or other medications supervised and um, integrated evidence-based um, treatment for addiction. Even people who were stable on those medications before they went into prison will often be taken off of those medications in prison. And so what we'd like to see is greater continuity of care um, using evidence-based treatments so that people don't face such a high risk immediately after they're released from prison. Is there, do you think there's an education component as well? Is there work that could happen aside from the important work linking people with the medication they need, but is, are there other things that you could do inside prisons or jails which you think might help reduce this risk? Well, I think people could be educated about the risk of deaths after release from prison, um, particularly related to opiates, mm. uh, opiate type drugs, and um, there's also interventions that are being tried in some places to give an opiate antidote called naloxone. Uh, to people who are leaving prison either before they leave or just after they leave in order to help them, in order to um, deliver in the event that someone does overdose. Mm -hmm. And so those interventions, but those things have not been widely taken up um, yet in the United States and they're being studied now. Okay. Where's the, the research going on on the use of things like naloxone? There's been some work being done in Rhode Island on that, um, and there's also been a national program in Scotland where they've also done work on giving prisoners naloxone as part of a national program after they're released from prison, and they're also doing another large study of that in the United Kingdom. But we're waiting for the results to be released. But we don't have all the results okay. yet, yes. Okay. Well, great. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Thanks.